Hey everybody, we're back and today's topic is legal research and we're going to tackle those citations that nobody likes, right? These blue book citations. Um, citations are those things uh, that you put in your briefs or in your memorandums where you're citing to um, a case or a statute or an ALR article, which is the American Law Reports. How do you do that properly? Um, so here we go. This slideshow is just going to be um, showing you examples of different citations and how to properly do it um, and pointing out some things. Your textbook is going to have more um, of these. You can also look up the Blue Book citations online. Um, so, But I want to give you the basics so that while you're studying for your exams and your certification exam that you'll understand the differences between, okay, why does this citation look like this and not, and not another way. All right, so let's dig right in. We're going to focus on federal things. We're going to hit on some state stuff, but for the purposes of general exams and certification exams, you're mostly going to be dealing with federal things. So, um, you know, the specifics of your state um, are going to be particular to your state. Like I said, we will get to some state things, but let's start off with the United States Constitution, right? The big guy. <laughs> so how do you cite to the Constitution? Well, um, there are two different uh, possible citation formats. The first one is whenever you're um, citing to a particular article um, with a clause. Um, and the second one is whenever you're looking at a, an amendment. Um, so you can see it's pretty standard. Um, those are how the abbreviations are. Um, I've got the spacing all correct on this slide. Um, and the where, you know, what is capitalized is capitalized and what isn't isn't. This is one of those things where you're either just going to have to memorize how this is set up or you're going to have to know where to find it in the blue book or where to find um, something to help you as you're doing those briefs or memorandums. Okay, so that was the Constitution. Let's look at statutes. Okay, so the United States Code. This is where we keep all of those federal statutes, right? Um, you do not have to include the proper name of the act or the bill or the law, whatever you want to call it. Um, actually, bill wasn't the right term, but the law. Um, you don't have to include that if it has already been codified in the United States Code. If it has already been published there, you simply need to cite to the code section. So here's an example of one without the name. That would be 15 USC, standing for U.S. Code, the section symbol with the uh, uh, number 7. And you always want to put the, the year that that code was enacted. So this was a 1988 one, for example. Now, if you add the name, you simply put the name with a comma. This one happens to be the robinson patman Act with a comma, um, and that's at 15 USC. Now, the whole act isn't just at 7, okay, or that's not just what you're referring to. Um, in this particular one, we're saying it's sections 4 through 6. So you notice we put two section symbols. That's why there's two of them, because we're talking about multiple sections, and again, it's 1988. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. That is optional to add the name. Now, if the law has not yet been codified, and we talked about um, in some of our different lectures, where once that bill um, is passed, it becomes a, um, a slip law, um, and it's a session law until that session of Congress is over and those are published in your statutes at large until they are codified in the United States Code. So while they're still waiting to find themselves in those happy little code section in the hardback books, okay, those imagine it has to be published in this big hardback book until it gets there. It's going to be in these loose leaf statute at large, these basically these giant three ring binders, okay? Um, in that case, you have to include the popular name because people aren't going to know how to look it up. So they're going to look it up. For example, in this one is the Health Care Act, and then it shows you that it's um, um, public law 92-117. And it's 83, and that STAT stands for Statutes at Large, 624, and it's 1987. Okay, so that's where you would find that until it made its way into the United States Code. Once it makes its way into the United States Code, you would not um, cite to it in that way. Hopefully that makes sense, and hopefully you're not citing to a bunch of statutes at large 
um, but sometimes it is necessary to do. Okay, what about all those procedural rules, like the rules of evidence, the rules of criminal procedure? Um, well, um, this slide shows you how to do that. Um, this is how the federal rules are cited to. It's pretty simple. Again, it's just understanding and learning what those abbreviations are. And then um, all you do is, like, for example, for Rule 2 of the Federal Rules of Appellate Procedure, you just have Fed R App. Um, P, which for short for procedure, and then two is the rule. Okay, you don't have to put the word rule in there or anything. Um, that is simply how you do it. Same thing for the other ones on this slide. Um, okay, so now let's get into how do you cite to a case. Okay, so if we're, you know we're in West Virginia, so state of West Virginia versus Anita Smith. Okay, that's a lot of words. Um, the first thing we're going to know is that Anita Smith. We're not going to need her first name. We're only going to need her last name. Um, and last names are called surnames. So if you weren't familiar with that term, now you are. A surname is somebody's last name. So that would be State of West Virginia versus Smith. But when you're talking about the government as a party, you're going to abbreviate to either state or, if it's the United States government, United States. So in my example I gave you, it would be State versus Smith. Okay, so we would take all of that other stuff out and boil it down to State versus Smith. If she was found herself in a, in a case, a, a federal criminal case, it would be United States versus Smith. Now, they're going to try to catch you on these certification exams because when the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, is involved in a case, they're referred to as commissioner, not the Internal Revenue Service or the IRS. So in that case, if Anita Smith was in trouble with them, it would be commissioner versus Smith. Okay? Now, subsequent history. Sometimes you want to cite to a case that has had stuff happen afterwards in that particular case. So I'll give you an example. Okay, let's pretend we are in the lowest federal court in West Virginia, and that's either going to be the Northern District of West Virginia or the Southern District of West Virginia. We'll just say Northern, okay? So we're in the Northern District of West Virginia, and we have a case. And um, we want to cite to that case. We can. We can cite to that case. And that case is going to find itself in what are called the federal supplements. Okay, that's a series of books, series of reporters. It's called the federal supplements. Um, but after that case in the Northern District, it was appealed because people weren't happy what happened. So they appealed to um, a court higher, their next highest court, which is the Fourth Circuit. So that is a court of appeals. Um, federally. So they appealed to the Fourth Circuit. Well, that case was decided upon, it was heard and it was decided upon, and then it was published in what's called the Federal Reporters. So that case was also published. And then, again, that our little case was appealed and it found its way to the United States Supreme Court and then it was reported um, in the U.S. reports. Okay? So but we don't want to cite the Supreme Court case. We don't want to cite to the Court of Appeals or the Fourth Circuit case. We want to cite to that very first one because we like that language that was in that case. Um, so we are going to have to, when we cite to that first case, we have to cite to everything that happened afterwards so that the people who are reading our brief or our memorandum understand that that case didn't end there that it continued to go on. That's what's called the subsequent history. And you have to show that. And there's slides um, in this slideshow that show you how to do that. There's another thing called parallel citations. This is whenever you're citing to a state case. And in a state case, like for example in West Virginia, we have the West Virginia Reporters, which is where all of our West Virginia Supreme Court cases are published. And so we're going to cite to that first because, you know, that's where we keep all of our cases. But we're also going to cite to another place where it can be found, which is in the Southeastern Reporters, because that's the region that we are in. So the reason why they're called parallel citations, because when you think of parallel lines, right, they're side by side. Well, these cases can be found in both places. It's the exact same case, it's just going to have a different book that it's in. Um, so we want to make sure that we always cite to the state first and then to the 
the regional reporter where it can also be found and then we'll show you how to do that in later slides okay so just understand the definition of terms here subsequent history is whenever something happened after that case and you want to make sure you refer to all those things and then parallel citation is just the exact same case but it's it's found in two different books um, and something else to remember always is that whenever you cite to a case you either want to underline the case name or you want to put it in italics they mean the exact same thing, italics or underlining, and but once you choose one, if you're going to italicize a case name in your brief, make sure that all of the case names in your brief are italicized. Um, don't underline some and italicize some. That's not consistent. It's not proper format. So choose what you like to use and then always follow that format. Okay, so some state case examples. Um, sorry, I guess I flipped through a couple here. Um, so let's look at um, federal case examples. All right, so um, the first one is found in the U.S. Uh, reporters. It's a U.S. Supreme Court case. It is Avery versus Exxon Company. Okay, so you see we took out first names. Company is there because it's, it's part of the Exxon Company name. Um, and it's found in volume 397, the U.S. reporters, page 812 and the year that it was decided was 1991. That's so a really simple example. Um, now, Smith versus Jones. This is also a federal case. You notice it's in the federal reporters, Fed Second, which means it is a circuit court, a court of appeals case. Um, so in the parentheses, you need to tell your reader when you're citing to this, which circuit court was it in? Was it in the Ninth Circuit, the the Tenth or the uh, Fourth Circuit? Was it in the Third Circuit? In this case, it was in the Third Circuit. So you would put that there, and you would put 1992, which is the year that it was decided. So that identifies that it's in the Federal Reporters, and that it was a Third Circuit case, and the Third Circuit covers a certain region. All right. The next example is United States versus Central Railroad, and this one happens to be italicized to show you that that's also proper. You notice this case happens to be in Fed Supplements, the Federal Supplements. So you know because it's in the supplements that it is the from the lowest court is from a district court. So you have to tell your reader in the parentheses which district court that it came from. In this particular example, it came from the Northern District of Illinois, and it's a 1990 case. You see the pattern here? You have to let them know what... Uh, court it came from um, and you should know to do that based on if it's in the supplement you know it's in the lowest federal court if it's in the reporter it's in the court of appeals so it's one of the the circuits um, and if it's if it's in the supreme court it's simply u.s all right so here's here's an example of subsequent history that we talked about on one of the previous slides <clears throat> now you notice it's commissioner so we know from one of the previous slides that that is the internal revenue service that is the irs so it's commissioner versus jc penny company <clears throat> The case that we cited to, the case that we pulled our quote from, because we really liked that language, was from a lower court case. It was from the Federal Supplements. Um, 429 was the volume, Federal Supplement, page 57. Okay. Now, in parentheses, we have to tell the reader what district, federal district court that came from, and it happens to be from Nebraska. Now, Br Nebraska doesn't have a northern district or a southern district, so we didn't have to put those additional abbreviations. Um, we just had to put Nebraska, and the year of the case is 1991. Then we put a comma, because that was a, a federal district court case that had more history to it. Things happened after that case in Nebraska. So, now, you see the word affirmed, okay, the abbreviation for the word affirmed. That means that this case was appealed to the circuit that, that handles Nebraska, which happens to be the Eighth Circuit, and we have to put affirmed in there because it says that, hey, the Eighth Circuit agreed with this case. And you can see um, that it's at 509 Federal 2nd. It's in the Federal Reporters because it's a circuit court case, a court of appeals, page 318. And in parentheses, we have to tell the reader which circuit was this in. It happens to have been in the 8th Circuit, 1992. Um, and then another comma, because apparently this was appealed again. And it was sent to the United States Supreme Court, who, if you see, it says cert denied. 
That means the United States Supreme Court refused to hear this case, and their refusal was documented at 417 U.S. 622 in 1993. Um, CERT, C-E-R-T, stands for, it's an, it's an abbreviation for writ of certiorari, um, which is what you file, you file writ of certiorari, you ask the United States Supreme Court, will you hear my case? And they either say yes or no. When they say no, they deny. And you have to document that this was attempted to be appealed to the United States Supreme Court, but they refused to hear it. Had they heard it, you would have just put whether or not it was affirmed or denied or whatever. You would have, uh, I'm sorry, affirmed or overruled. You would have put something. Um, and then you would have put the United States Supreme Court um, citation for it. Okay. The next one, um, this is one where you're not citing to the actual majority opinion, which was the regular case. You're reciting to, you're citing to a part of the case where Justice Stevens was dissenting. So you see in the parentheses, this is a United States Supreme Court case. It tells you at uh, volume 551, the U.S. Reporters, page 47, you see there's a common that has 56. Well, specifically on page 56. Um, that is where we pulled our quote from, and it happened to be from Justice Stevens's dissent. So you're going to put that in parentheses. Once you have cited a case in its entirety, okay, like the examples we just went through, when you cite to that case again in your case brief or your memorandum, you're going to use abbreviations. So, for example, that um, Safeco versus um, um, the Safeco Insurance Company of America versus Burr, you can now refer to it as just simply Safeco and then the 551 U.S. at 49. That just means you're talking about page 49. Um, if you wanted to, you could even just use 551 U.S. at 49, or you can even just even go smaller and say it. It means I just cited to this case at page 49, okay? Uh, if you have any questions about that, please contact your instructor or contact me directly. Um, I'd be more than happy to explain that to you in more depth. Okay, here's some state case examples. Um, okay, so now um, the first example I show you is Kansas. Okay, so let's say that you were in Kansas and you're citing to Sanders versus Keaton, Inc. Okay, notice that it's underlined. And this is an example of a parallel citation that we talked about in a previous slide. You would find this case um, on, on, in volume 238 of the Kansas Reporters, page 376. So you're going to list that first because that is the state that you were in, and that is the reporters that the lawyers in your state are going to look to first. But this case was also published at the exact same time, remember parallel means side by side, in the Pacific Reporters. So it was published uh, volume 457, Pacific 2nd, um, page 609, and that is a 1992 case. So you want to include both of those so people can look it up in either book. Now, if we are not in Kansas, we do not need to cite to the Kansas reporters. We simply need to cite to the regional reporter, which in this case was the Pacific Second. But in the parentheses, we need to tell our reader what state did that come from, because the Pacific Reporters covers multiple states. We want to know that this was a Kansas state, so in the parentheses, we're going to put the abbreviation for Kansas. I hope you're catching on to how they, they've done this. Now, Here's another example. In Minnesota, same thing. You're going to cite to the Minnesota reporters and then the Northwestern reporters um, as a parallel citation. Now, Indiana is special and unique. They do not have their own reporters, and they just specifically cite to the Northeastern reporters um, because that is their regional reporter. And in parentheses, you're going to put Indiana, the abbreviation for Indiana, so that they know that that was an Indiana case. Okay, now there are some other types of law that you may run across, and this is going to be administrative law. Administrative agencies are things like the Department of Health and Human Resources. Um, these are federal agencies um, that have been formed to provide certain uh, services to the citizens of this country, and when you cite to their rules and regulations, you're going to be citing to either the Federal Register or the Code of Federal Regulations. Now, the Federal Register is where they go first. Once these rules are um, enacted, once they go into effect, 
Um, and they haven't yet been published or put into a, uh, they haven't been codified yet, as we say. You're going to find them in the Federal Register, and those are done by date. So just the next rule that is, is uh, um, enacted goes in order. They just go in order. So um, when you cite to the Federal Register, um, there's an example right there of how you would cite to it. Um, and once the Federal Register, once they are codified and they're organized by topic, they find themselves in the code. They're codified, the Code of Federal Regulations. And that's called, you know, lawyers, we talk about it as the CFR. Um, and that also has a special way of um, citing. And again, it's right there. Okay. Um, for secondary authorities, sorry, I keep jumping back and forth. I keep accidentally hitting the computer. Um, okay, so secondary authorities. These are things like legal encyclopedias, um, dictionaries, and so on. Um, so the first example is of a law review. Um, it's set up a lot like, you know, maybe MLA or APA format that you were used to from, from high school or from other college uh, classes. Um, it's a pretty standard how you cite to a periodic or a magazine. Um, the ALR is set up very similar as well. You're going to give the author, um, you're going to you're going to give the title, and then you can say what place in the American Law Reports that it was found. Again, it's set up very similarly to those uh, citations that you would have been used to from other things before you got into the law. Um, and you see the legal encyclopedia um, and the legal dictionary. So again, I'm not going to read those to you because you can see them there. And again, it's just a matter of becoming familiar with how they're set up. You're not going to be citing to these as frequently as you are to the ones that I went in depth on, which would be your, your cases and your statutes and your um, regulations. Um, now, there are some things that you're going to put in your papers that are short forms. There's signals to let the reader know what you're doing. Um, so commonly used signals are things like um, C generally. And that just means that the authority that you're citing to, it, prevents some, it presents some helpful background for you about what you're talking about. So in case the person reading it wants to learn more about what you just said in your brief, they can see generally whatever it is that you've now cited to, whether it's an Amjur article or an ALR article or something. Um, now, CEG, I always think of it as C for example. This is where the authority that you've cited to directly supports you. It isn't just a general overview of what you're talking about. It's like, no, this directly supports what I'm talking about. Um, and again, they have, um, there's, the rest of these are listed here on this page. Again, it's just looking at these and understanding the definitions. Um, so there are some uh, short forms too um, below. We already talked about id. That just means, hey. I just cited to this thing completely. I don't want to write it out again. I don't want to type it out again. I'm just going to use the word id, okay? Um, and you can, you know, infra and supra, you can read those definitions. They're pretty self-explanatory um, on how you use them. You're going to see them frequently by this stage in your legal uh, career, um, you know, in your education. You've seen these multiple times. And that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, as always, please contact me directly or reach out to your instructor. Um, otherwise, have a great day.